Welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at an entirely new area and not focus so much on the diseases as the scientists who were involved in finding us cures for them and discovering how we might prevent them. These were what we now call today epidemiologists, but back then they worked on a particular hardship that we don't have today because most of the time they had no idea or any knowledge of the organisms that were causing these infectious diseases, which is what I'm going to focus on. Um, yet they had to look at clues, put down data, and find a way to eliminate something that was a total mystery to them. And they were really, in their own way, great geniuses. We're going to look at a few of those today. The first one is Edward Jenner, this gentleman, who uh, was British. He was a physician. And he, uh, although not as handsome as Anton von Leeuwenhoek, uh, was a very important man to the whole world in those days. His interest was in smallpox. And he, the problem with smallpox was that besides not knowing uh, what the cause was, it was the major killer of the 18th century. Killed about 10% of the population of Europe. It rose to about 20% in towns and cities where there were epidemics and a lot of crowding. It spread very easily because, again, it was droplet infection from the respiratory route. So it, in areas like the slums of London, people were crowded into housing and workplaces, and it just spread like wildfire. Among children at that time, it accounted for 30 to 40 percent of all childhood deaths, and Jenner named it the speckled monster because it killed quickly, and of course, people had all the little spots of the smallpox on their body and face. Now, this is caused by a virus of variola, the respiratory droplet root, and it enters and spreads to the internal organs via the bloodstream. And then it moves on to the skin where the classical rash comes out, or the pox. The symptoms uh, initially are fever, headache, backache, vomiting, general malaise. You're probably getting tired of hearing this. It sounds like the same old song, and it is. Most of these viruses uh, tend to give a similar symptom complex. Then there's an incubation period of about 10 days, and this is where the lethality is because these patients are infective during that time. Especially late in the incubation period, they get about a rash about three days after the onset of symptoms in many cases, but by then they may have already spread the disease. There is no treatment once this is, uh, the infection has taken place. However, it's not uniformly fatal or so nearly uniformly fatal as viruses like Ebola. Um, it goes back a long way in about uh, 1100 years before BCE. Uh, they found scars uh, on the mummy of the Pharaoh Ramses V, so they thought he probably had smallpox. And it came to the Americas by the European explorers. There was no smallpox in North and South America. Killed more Aztecs and North American Indians than all the battles with the invaders, with the white settlers, uh, because this population had no resistance to the disease. There was nobody in the population who was resistant. And in fact, another low point in our international relations, we gave the Native Americans blankets purposely infected with smallpox from smallpox victims. And since they had no natural immunity, it wiped out whole tribes in villages where these blankets were distributed. Some of the famous patients who had smallpox included Queen Elizabeth I, Mozart, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and these people uh, usually had uh, scars on their faces, and they do today. There are people alive today who survive smallpox, and they wear these scars. And this was the origin of veils and uh, beauty spots, which were supposed to hide the worst of the blemishes. Now, there was a, a, a custom called variolation. And since the virus is called variola, we deliberately gave smallpox back then Taken from mild cases, people who survived the disease and didn't seem too sick, we take viruses out of their pox, out of their sores, and put them, scratch them into other patients to give them a mild case of the disease. Uh, 
or we would put them in a room with patients with uh, this variola mild form. Unfortunately, a lot of people died from this because there were apparently other reasons that the disease was mild just than the nature of the disease itself. So Jenna's idea was that smallpox was probably more dangerous than variolation, but there was something called cowpox, which was probably less dangerous. This was seen in milkmaids who milked the cows with cowpox, and they had the sores on their hands, but they rarely got sick. And Jenner noticed they rarely got smallpox, even when they were among the people who had smallpox. His hypothesis was then if you infected somebody with cowpox, they would get immunity to smallpox, and he wanted to test it. If the variolation failed to produce a smallpox infection, then we knew the subject was immune, and he thought then if we exposed someone with cowpox and they didn't get the infection, they would be immune too, and possibly we could transfer uh, this kind of disease from, to other people. So he himself actually had been variolated at school. He was locked in a room in a stable with a bunch of boys that were artificially infected and stayed there until the disease ran its course. So he probably had some infection uh, and some immunity and was one of those people who could work in this situation uh, without getting the disease himself. Now, cowpox is called vaccinia. It comes from the word vaca, which means cow, and it's a related viral disease, but very, very mild. And in about May of 19, uh, sorry, 1796, there was a dairy maid that worked near Jenna. Her name was Sarah Nelms, and she was diagnosed with cowpox on her hands. And Jenna decided to do the provocative test and give it to a volunteer. Now, this is another low point. He chose for the volunteer an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps, who was the son of his gardener. So it was really something that nobody could say no to. Um, Jenner made scratches on James's arms, and he inoculated the virus from the milkmaid from Sarah's pox directly into James. And James developed a mild case of cowpox, which people do even today when we vaccinate them. They got a little fever. Uh, didn't feel so well, but he recovered. Now, a week later, to prove what happened, um, he had already proved that you could make cowpox go from person to person, not just from cow to person. We saw this kind of question coming up with avian flu. Next, he took Phipps, a little boy, and injected him with smallpox. And fortunately, the little boy did not get the smallpox then, and then later on, Jenner did it again to make sure, and the boy seemed to be immune. So he knew that vaccination, which is what he then called it from vaccinia, became uh, a feasible way to prevent people from getting smallpox. And to this day, basically, we still have found no cure and we use vaccination. If the boy had died, then I guess Jenner would have been a murderer. Um, I, 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 I have trouble with this, but we have to look back. It was a different era. era. It was hundreds of years ago, and things were a little different. But he did uh, create a great service to mankind. This method of doing it went on for a long time. My own French teacher said that he was in France in the 1940s, and when he was at school, they would bring a cow into the school that had cowpox, the cow would be tethered to somebody's desk and they would make little incisions in the side of the cow, not deep enough to make the cow bleed, but to weep clear fluid, which was the hopefully the vaccinia virus in it. And they would take little needles and touch it to the cow and then inoculate it into all the children. And it worked. In 1977, smallpox became the first disease eliminated from the face of the earth. That had never happened before. The last known case of human disease was in Somalia, and some lab-contracted diseases, disease that was from people working in it, um, were found after that. But in, by the year 2000, there was no reports of smallpox anywhere in the world in a human being.
and one of the, this is probably the greatest triumph of a massive worldwide inoculation program, just getting out there, finding the people and inoculating them. It's a good moment to look at some of the methods because I think it's a, a, of great interest. There's something called herd immunity, and H-E-R-D, when most of the animals in a group are immune to infection, then you don't need to vaccinate everybody or immunize everybody. The, if there are 95% of the people in the population are safe, then the other 5% are not gonna get it from those people. So in areas where you can't inoculate everybody, you can do a lot of good by making sure you get most of the susceptible people. There's something else called ring vaccination. In ring vaccination, you vaccinate everybody who is susceptible in a geographical area around the outbreak. And you move that ring out to a distance that varies with the individual locale and in most of the third world is how far people can go on foot within a certain number of days, let's say to market in a nearby village. And you make that outer ring, the buffer zone, and you inoculate everybody in certain ring distances so that if people who go out of the ring and come back are going to be exposed, they get inoculated. The people that stay within the clear ring don't need to be inoculated and then you can slowly wipe it out of the entire area. And this was another one of the methods used to control smallpox up until that last case in 1977. Um, this is an important thing, this herd immunity and ring immunity, because there are some people who cannot get smallpox vaccinations. You have people who are just too sick, their immune systems won't raise the immunity especially children who may have other diseases in these third world countries. Pregnant women are generally not vaccinated because it may have a bad effect on the baby, people with cancer, other diseases that cause a weak immune, immune systems, and especially people with bad rashes like eczema because the vaccinia can become generalized over their whole body and that can be very destructive. It's interesting that the last patient in Somalia uh, was a health worker, an old man who contracted the disease in spite of being vaccinated. He never developed enough immunity. And he was tracking down the last two cases he had heard about, which were way out in the country, two young children in a remote village, and he went out there to isolate them, care for them, and then inoculate anybody near them. And he somehow contracted smallpox, and he survived. And that's the last person we know about. Now, one of the reasons we're able to do this is because smallpox is a person-to-person -person disease. It does not have any sylvatic, which means forest, sylvatic reservoir. And therefore, you can get rid of smallpox where you we can never get rid of rabies. Rabies lives in too many wild animals. There'll always be a reservoir. Polio is similar to smallpox. Uh, there was a worldwide effort to in inoculate all the children with the Sabin vaccine, the live attenuated one, and you could get person-to-person -person transmission of the immunity. And we have very close to 100% control, but we're not there yet. There have been some recent outbreaks in the sub-Saharan Africa and on the Indian subcontinent, but we're trying. We're you know, we're, we're spending the money and getting the people, the volunteers and the paid workers to get out there into the remote areas and try uh, to eliminate this disease as well, which we should be able to do. The next one I want to talk about is a man named John Snow, who also lived in England in uh, the mid-1800s. Snow was interested in what was then called Asiatic cholera, a very severe bacterial infection, as you know now, caused by the Vibrio cholera. It's characterized by massive rice water stools, diarrhea, and death is from dehydration and organ failure. Talk a little bit about that when we get to shock. Symptoms are, you could guess, intense thirst, weakness, sunken eyes, decreased urine, dry skin, all the signs of shock and finally unconsciousness and death with kidney failure as well. It was initially believed in those days, because nobody had seen the cholera vibrio, to be a disease of poor, striking most in the crowded, uh, poverty-stricken neighborhoods of Europe, 
and Asia. And Americans actually believed it originated in non-Christian areas, that cleanliness was next to godliness, and therefore godliness would protect them. Uh, that didn't turn out to be the case. In uh, 1817 in Calcutta, in India, there was a massive outbreak and it was at a three-month religious festival on the Ganges River, a great place for the cholera of Vibrio to grow, to be passed, because you had crowds and crowds of people, literally millions of people from all over India. There were massive fatalities in the hundreds of thousands and then people went back to their villages and brought the cholera with them. And at least 10,000 uh, British Army uh, soldiers died who were there as part of their um, army service. From India, it went along land and sea trade routes and finally got again into Europe in the 1800s. And the doctors at this time thought it was, again, lack of cleanliness, but they didn't know how. A uh, major epidemic in the 1830s was starting to suggest a relationship between cholera and dirty, poor neighborhoods with a contaminated sewage system, and they thought maybe it was in the sewer gases. They could smell it, it smelled awful, so they called this a miasma, a humor, something in the air again. And then in, in 1854, in the summer in Soho, there was a big outbreak. In the first three days of this outbreak, 127 people died, and then uh, somewhere about 10,600 documented cases in several other cities around London. This gentleman, Dr. John Snow, was an anesthesiologist and a part-time uh, epidemiologist. And as E.O. Wilson would have called him today, he's a consilient thinker. He brought lots of different areas of expertise to the subject, and he thought this might be waterborne. He thought the contamination might be the source of the disease, and the locals still thought it was a miasma. Snow thought it was not breathed in, it was not a miasma, he thought it was ingested, and he did something very interesting. This is a map of Soho, and you can see uh, Oxford Street and other streets, and right in the middle is Broad Street. And if you look at the X's on the map, there are several pumps that are marked with an X, and each of the black squares, that was where a death occurred. And he noticed that there was the greatest concentration nearest the pump. And as you moved away from the center, the concentration lessened. Now, there was a man named Henry Whitehead who was a local curate, he took care of the local population, both spiritually and, and physically, and he knew the details of the spread of the epidemic. So he knew where it was breaking out, and he knew that the cases way out here in the periphery had actually occurred to people who got their drinking water at the Broad Street pump, but then took the bottle back to their homes. And they were, in effect, still consumers of the Broad Street pump water, he also knew that there was a leaking sewage pipe that could be contaminating the well, and that there was a sick baby whose mother rinsed the dirty diapers out in right next to the pump. So he probably pinpointed this, and Snow was convinced that the Broad Street pump was the center of this epidemic, and it was waterborne. And really, nobody else believed him except Henry Whitehead. What he did was he went down to the pump and he took the handle off the pump. People now had to walk five or six blocks away to another pump and get their water and immediately the epidemic came to an end. Within a few days, there were no new cases. And in medicine today, we still call this taking the handle off the pump. When you go directly to the source of a problem and intervene, we say that's taking the handle off the pump. There is a memorial pump now on Broad Street in Soho, which you can visit, and it has no handle. Uh, Snow never lived to see the actual cholera vibrio. He never found out what it was. Uh, there was an Italian named Filippo Pacini who identified the vibrio, and he wasn't acknowledged for more than 30 years as well, so nobody got much credit except Dr. Snow, who now has this memorial named after him.
I want to move on now to another pioneer in epidemiology, and that was Louis Pasteur. He was the father of the germ theory of a disease, although he didn't see a lot of germs. And he began working on, among other things, he remember we, we get the name pasteurization of our milk from Louis Pasteur, um, but he began working on rabies, and he knew that the organism, whatever it was, was present in the saliva of the victims. And because a form of what they called madness was common uh, with rabies, he reasoned it must attack the central nervous system. So it was passed on in the saliva by the bite of either the human or the dog or the other animals. And um, yet it must affect the brain or the central nervous system in some way. Another thing they noticed was the farther from the brain the longer the bite was, the longer it took to get there. So a bite on the hand took longer to infect the patient than a bite on the face. And therefore, he suggested maybe it's going up the nerves in the spinal cord. So he examined tissue from the brain and spinal cords of some of the victims and found evidence of something there. He couldn't see the organism. It's a virus, remember. But he knew something was there. There was a response. The, the tissue looked bad. And he was sure he could make a vaccine from this. And he wanted to make what we now call an attenuated vaccine. So in 1885, he was building upon the vaccination concept. He was preparing this. Uh, he had experiments on the spinal cords of rabbits. He had infected rabbits, trying to attenuate the agent. And what he did was actually, he took the rabbit's spinal cords and he let them dry out. And then he gathered up material. He chopped it up, macerated it, put it in a solution, infected another animal until he could see the disease was getting less and less severe. He was trying to attenuate and produce a down-regulated virus or an attenuated virus. And he was pretty much satisfied that he could prevent the disease in dogs, but he would not dare test this in humans or even a volunteer, much less what, what uh, Jenner did. He was not an MD, so technically he was not licensed to treat people. He was supposed to only be an experimental a scientist. Well, in July of 1885, the decision was made for him. A woman came in with her nine-year-old boy named Joseph Meister. Uh, he had been bitten many, many times by a severely rabid dog in his village, which was about two days away. She heard about Pasteur in Paris, brought him in. And in this case, first of all, he knew he had to try because the boy was doomed to die in a few days. If the boy died, he wouldn't be blamed because he's going to die anyway. But if he did nothing, he knew he was condemning the boy to death. So he decided to try. He took some of this rabbit-made uh, vaccine that he uh, had just finished preparing and injected Joseph every day, in fact, 12 times over the next 10 days. The bites healed. The boy went home, never came down with rabies. Once you come down with the rabies symptoms, the, all the different neurologic problems the rabies victim has, uh, the disease is uniformly fatal. Once it reaches the brain, there's nothing you can do. And Joseph uh, Meister felt he owed his life to Louis Pasteur. And when he grew up, he became the gatekeeper at the Pasteur Institute. And he took special care until the day he died of Pasteur's tomb, which was there. So the news of this cure went all over Europe. Physics uh, victims with bites from rabbit animals flooded into Paris, and Pasteur treated them and really proved that this was safe, effective way. Now, he had successfully developed a vaccine for use in humans made from animals. And the development of the rabies vaccine saved thousands of lives because this was a really rampant disease then, not like smallpox or other ones. But what it did was it really showed the way for the development of other vaccines and other techniques against other diseases. So Pasteur had won the, um, he'd won the, the praise of everybody for this, but he also continued his practice in many other areas of microbial, antimicrobial medicine, antiviral uh, medicine, though he never ever knew um, what these medicine, what these diseases were caused by.
The vaccines today have changed over the many, many years since Pasteur. Of course, we prepare them in laboratories under much more sterile conditions than rabbit, uh, rabbit spinal cords. And over the period of time in the middle of this century till the end of this century, the rabies vaccine was still very problematic. It was a course of approximately 25 shots given in the abdominal wall. People used to think it was given in the, quote, stomach. It wasn't. It was injected into the abdominal wall. But these were deep intramuscular injections. They were very, very painful. They caused a huge local reaction, and there was a real difficulty with compliance. This went on for several weeks. And I, uh, I, I had a friend who was bitten by a dog thought to be rabid in Moscow, went to the Russian health system at the time in the 60s, and had to have these shots. And it was really all the family could do to get somebody to comply with so many painful shots, often in children. This was another big problem. This, these are the ones who play with dogs and get in trouble. And uh, it also had a lot of side effects. These vaccines were not as pure as other vaccines, and people were still getting sick from the vaccine itself. We have since that time developed better rabies vaccine. There are not so many shots necessary, but it is a series of shots, which as you now know, is causing an anamnestic response. The problem is, the only people who get these shots prophylactically are people who handle animals that might be uh, carrying rabies. People, for example, like um, somebody who works in the national park or the wilderness who might come in contact with raccoons. In this country, raccoons are a huge sylvatic carrier of rabies. And worse yet, bats. It depends where you live in America um, as to what you're exposed to. So bats are another big carrier. They are not vampires, but they do give you rabies. So these people are inoculated against rabies. They can spread out the shots and get booster doses to get the anamnestic response that you know about. We don't have that much time with a patient who's been bit, especially bitten, especially if it's on the face or nearer the brain. So what we do instead is we have something called post-exposure vaccination, and that includes two, two modalities. First, we take passive rabies uh, immunoglobulins. We get patients who either have had a rabies bite and survive because of vaccination, or patients who um, have had the inoculation. We take their blood, take off the plasma, give them back their red cells so they don't get anemic, and then we use that plasma to plasmapherese, which means purify, the uh, antibodies, the specific Ig immunoglobulins against rabies. And now we have methods to remove other viral contaminants. So you don't give the patient hepatitis while you're giving them rabies vaccine. And today we will then give the patient passive immunity, which you now have learned about, so that while they're building up their immunity to the rabies, they've got passive protection, and then we give them the rabies shots at the same time. Here is a photograph of the man who did all this, Louis Pasteur, in his prime. There have been numerous paintings, probably the most famous one, of him looking at his cell cultures. Notice again, no white coats in these laboratories because they didn't know what germs were. And they didn't know very much. This guy was the first one to learn about it. And finally, a, a very famous picture of him treating Joseph Meister at the Pasteur Institute. And that brings us to the end of our look at that huge group of invaders, the microorganisms and the infectious diseases.